good evening, everyone. Grab your hymn books. Hymn number 198, Joy Unspeakable and Full of Glory. That's hymn number 198. We can all stand and sing together. 198. I have found His grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. and full of glory oh the half has never yet been told in number 198 on the second verse I have found the I once craved it is joy and peace within what a wondrous blessing I am saved from the awful gulf of sin Unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. All oh, that last verse. I have found the joy no tongue can tell. How its waves of glory roam. It is like a great poor flow. Well, springing up within my soul, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. All the hap has never yet been told. Thank you very much, Thomas. Good evening. Welcome to services tonight. Let's uh, have a word of prayer as we get things started. Brother Francis, if you would, sir, would you please open our service in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege to be here in your house, Lord. We, uh, uh, we, we thank you for all the blessings that, that we've received uh, from yesterday, today, and all that you'll do tomorrow. Uh, Lord, be with us this evening uh, as, we, as we hear from your word and, and we bring praise and, and glory to you. Uh, give the pastor the words to say. Let give us uh, an open ears and open minds and heart to to have to take for us what you would have for us, and and to retain it and be able to take it throughout the week to those that may or may not know you. Uh, Lord, just be with each and every one of us this evening. Uh, give us what you would have, and we'll give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Please be seated. Nice to see you this evening. Thanks for coming out to the services tonight. We, um, uh, many folks have off tomorrow, and if you do, I hope you enjoy some uh, restful time. Uh, but it's good to be in the Lord's house this evening. I just want to remind the fellows, particularly, we have a men's prayer uh, coming up this Saturday. That's at 7 o'clock uh, here uh, at the church house. Short devotion, time of prayer together. Um, please do continue to remember Brother George Stark. He is in a rehabilitation center, and uh, uh, I saw him, when did I see him? I saw him Friday. He was doing really well standing up and um, getting around, getting some exercise and getting his strength back. Whoever smuggled him in cheeseburgers, he said, thank you so much. And uh, he was doing really well. Um, he may be getting out of the hospital, uh, out of the rehab this week and uh, uh, getting back home. So uh, do pray for him. It'll be a little bit of a transition for him. Um, for a little while until he gets all his strength back, but uh, do pray for Brother George, all right? Um, let's go over our memory verse and uh, another song and uh, get, do some preaching tonight. So, Tom, um, Stephen, brother, thank you. Okay, Psalm 131 again real quick. If you turn there with me, Psalm 131. And if you're there, if you could read that nice and loud with me. It says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. 
my soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Yes, my son is still learning to quiet himself. He's still working on that. Anybody been working on that this afternoon? No? All right. That's all right. Until planning time. Keep working on it. Tom? They survived. Yeah. That's good. Hymn 89, Does Jesus Care? Let's all stand. We can sing. Hymn number 89, Does Jesus Care? Does Jesus care when my heart is pain? Thomas. Thank you, Di. And uh, let's take our Bibles, if you would, please, and go with me to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8 this evening as we get started. And uh, Brother Stephen, it's just kind of humorous when you're up here and the kids are, are uh, having a great time down there. And uh, I was, um, when, when our children were younger, Joyce and I both were uh, always involved in different things in the ministry. And so our kids often sat in the pews by themselves, and they behave themselves, right, Tom? Behave themselves most of the time very well. And uh, I don't know if you can, um, you can say that for the entirety of the time that they were on their own, but we used to uh, uh, keep an eye on them from the choir loft on occasion, or if I was preaching somewhere, we'd, they'd be sitting somewhere and they having a great time. But Anyway, it's always, it's always entertaining when the little kids are around. I want to talk about uh, children uh, and Bible study tonight. And, uh, I, you know, our attendance is kind of low this evening. There's a lot of folks home sick, and uh, hopefully a lot of folks are watching online. I really hope uh, they are. Um, but um, Nehemiah chapter 8 is where I wanted to get started at tonight because uh, there's a phrase here that's always gotten my attention. And, uh, and so just remain seated. The Bible begins here. Nehemiah chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1. Of course, this is a, it's a preaching setting, a public preaching setting. And it says, All the people gather themselves together as one man unto the street that was before the water gate. This is in the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah has just rebuilt uh, the city walls with the help of all the people. Everybody pitched in, kind of built right, you know, right around where they lived at. And the entire city was enclosed. All the gates were set up. It was a wonderful thing. Um, 
They spake unto Ezra the scribe, and we know we're introduced to Ezra even back in the days uh, as we were on Thursday nights, we're talking, we're going through the book of, of Haggai, and that's that same time frame. So we're just fast forward a little bit. Uh, Ezra's a, quite a bit older from that time, uh, but he's still a part of the, of the worship services there in Jerusalem. They spake unto Ezra the scribe, bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And that, that phrase, uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll talk about it. And I want to talk about Bible reading and talking about children and try, engaging them uh, in the ministry of the Word of God. And let's, let's pray. Father, I do thank you, Lord. And I, I do I know there's a lot of folks in our ministry that have had this cold and uh, there's uh, many other folks that are away for all kinds of different reasons. And I, and I do pray, Lord, that you would bless and minister to those that can't be here tonight. And, and uh, Father, I do thank you for those that uh, follow along whenever they can't attend. But, Father, I just want to thank you for those that are here this evening. And I pray, Father, that this message be an encouragement for all of us, not only as we minister to children, but also, Lord, as we are, um, have a, um, a very healthy curiosity uh, when we approach your word. And uh, Lord, I, I pray you'd bless tonight and use it to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, there's uh, three groups of people that are mentioned in this particular portion of Scripture. That's men and that's women, and that is all that could hear with understanding. And that particular phrase of Scripture, I've always um, I've looked at that in, in making reference to children, that folk, uh, ch uh, young ones that are old enough to understand what is being said. And, and I look at that and I, um, um, I make the conclusion myself personally that children ought to be included within preaching services. Um, that's one of the reasons, uh, of course, we have a lot of different ministries for kids. And uh, I don't know, it, it's been, I, don't, I can't even remember how many years ago this is, but we made a decision here at New Testament uh, to have a Sunday evening service without any other ministries. We do have a nursery. We'll always have a nursery for the, for the, for the real wee ones. Um, but um, we purposely had Sunday nights set apart that everybody could be in attendance uh, during the preaching service because I think it's important that children uh, sit in in a preaching service. It's good for them to learn to sit for a period of time. Uh, but it's also good for them to be able to sit and hear the Word of God and understand that they are actually a part of the church services and that they are responsible also for what's said from the pulpit. And uh, they, they as, as it's said right here, um, they could hear with understanding. And, that, and this is exactly what's, what's going on here. Uh, if you drop down a few more verses, I'm just reading verse number 8. So they read the book of the law of God distinctly. And gave the sense and caused them, that them is, of course, all of those included in the service here, to understand the reading. And so you have the presentation of the Word of God and then, of course, some information that comes along with it, if you would, preaching to, to, um, um, to define what's being said and, and, of course, an understanding given. And so I mean, it's, it's just a great reminder of God's desire that everyone participate in the Word of God. And, you know, we've been talking about Bible reading and talking about Bible study and talking about different uh, methodologies and things like that. We, we spoke, we took a little bit of time, went through that great section there in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And, uh, you know, the, 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 all Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We looked at that and, and made that um, kind of drafted a, a, a method by which you, as you're reading the Scriptures, try to find things that, that have, you know, what is this teaching and, and what is this correcting and, and how is this, you know, how does this apply to my way? What's the instructions that are there? We, we looked at those type of things, but there's a lot of different ways to approach the Word of God. And, and of course, when it comes to having children, whether it's your own children or whether it's your grandchildren or whether it's, you know, a Sunday school class or junior church or whatever the atmosphere is, um, children need to be included in this a portion where we're saying we're, we're reading the Word of God and we're, we're, we're reading it distinctly and we're making the sense of it. It's an engaging, and children need a little bit more engagement sometimes. I think we all kind of do need some engagement in the Word of God. I want to read another portion of Scripture. If you'd like to turn there, that's fine, but it's in Isaiah chapter 28. 
And um, this is kind of a rebuke on the nation of Israel, but it says this in Isaiah 28, verse number 9. It says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Of whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and draw from the breast. For perfect, uh, excuse me, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And he's speaking about children and who are we going to teach, who are we going to teach a doctrine to, who are we going to teach to understand things? Well, let's teach the children. As soon as they're weaned, as soon as they're old enough uh, to understand things, let's begin to teach them. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a rebuke on the nation of Israel. Maybe they'll understand. Maybe they'll get it uh, because apparently the adults aren't. That's kind of the rebuke that's extended here. But, um, um, you know, the necessity of children understanding the Word of God, of course, you know, we do take it seriously at New Testament Baptist Church. We, we take an uh, approach uh, in our Sunday school and junior church uh, they are age appropriate. We have teachers uh, that are well gifted in making sure that children are instructed at an age level uh, appropriate um, to them and they understand things. There's a lot of interaction with the real little ones. There's a lot of hands on type of stuff. And, but um, when, when, I, um, um, when I have an opportunity of teaching kids, <coughs> I... Um, I've always enjoyed engaging. Um, when our kids were younger, we did, a, we did, I don't, just gobs of different things with our kids personally. I'm talking about our home and Bible studies and Bible reading with the kids. We did lots of different things. I, I'm not, I, and I, I do say this a lot when I talk about personal things. I don't, I'm not going to say we did everything right. Um, but we did a lot of different things. Um, I want to make a couple comments that are personal to me. And so if they apply to you, great. If not, you know, you, you're, it's your family, you know your kids. Um, we shied away from Bible stories as in storybooks. Um, I, it's not a doctrinal position, uh, but I do know, like from Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, that that was the presentation of the Word of God. It was, this was a preaching service, needless to say, in Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, but if, if someone was old enough to understand, then they could be presented with the Word of God. That just makes sense to me that children, um, if, they, if, if, if they can listen, um, they can hear the Word of God. So we, we did, I, I'm not saying we never used any Bible story lessons uh, but uh, generally, we used, the, we used the Bible. We did Bible reading. Um, we did a lot of different things, a lot of different ways, but we, uh, we always centered it around the Bible. Um, we often, when we did our Bible reading, um, if, the kids, if the kids could read, uh, so, you know, we're talking about, you know, first, second grade. Uh, if the kids could read, then, then I had them read. So uh, we often would sit back. Uh, it was, you know, most of the time it was either in, in one of the kids' bedrooms or on the living room floor or whatever. Um, seldom, it was, seldom it was around like a kitchen table type of setting. It was usually a little more, uh, more casual. But I would, I, we would often, you know, just go around verse by verse. We'd read like three or four verses and then the next one would read. And, um, and it's amazing. Um, so, you know, the fun part, of course, is, is all the names. That, that's always the most fun part. Um, uh, our, us adults, we butcher them most of the time. Imagine what kids do with them, all right? So, um, so we, we always had, con we had a lot of fun with that sometimes. Um, I still, I mean, you know, I'm fast forwarding like 40 years later. And, uh, you know, and when the kids are reading like the name Big Tha, they got, I don't know why they got the biggest kick out of Big Tha, but they talked about Big Tha, Big Tha for months, you know? And, uh, and so names were just a fun things. And there were times where you just kind of butcher the names. And, we, and, and you know, when you had the long genealogies on occasion, uh, we would, they would just read like the first letter. And A begat B and B begat Z. And, and they would do that just to kind of make it through without it, you know, sounding too horrible. 
And, and so these are kind of some of the things that we used to do. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of creative ways to engage children in Bible reading besides just telling them, sit down and be quiet, we're going to read the Bible. Um, that is not an exciting way for kids to read their Bible. Um, and so uh, engaging children in activities during Bible reading is always a good thing. Now, I've used a phrase, I used it tonight, and, um, and, and that is, you know, um, ha having a, uh, a healthy curiosity. Um, that is something that you have to develop uh, in a child's life. Um, and that's something that is, um, is good in, for general education's sake, but it's also good for Bible reading. And a healthy curiosity, uh, we're, we're going to do a little exercise tonight. So we're going to take our Bibles and we're going to go to 1 Samuel. We're going to go to chapter 17. So what's the story in 1 Samuel 17? Anybody know? Any guesses? David and Goliath, exactly. Oh, this is classic stuff here. David and Goliath. And um, David and Goliath is a great story. Now, um, when you're doing Bible reading, with, particularly with kids, young, even, even young people, when I say kids, you know, I'm not, you know, how old are you? You're five years old. Are you reading yet? Yeah, that's good. Amen. So when you're doing Bible reading with kids, um, you know, it's, it's, um, that can be a lot of fun, and you do a lot of interaction as they get older. Uh, Owen, how old are you nowadays? Eleven. Eleven? Okay. Charlie, you're? Seven. Seven? Oh, man. Oh, they grow up so fast. And so, you know, different age groups, you know what your child's capable of as far as reading and as far as participation. Uh, and so... You know, it's, you know, especially when you have several different kids, um, you can really engage in a lot of different ways. But the, the story of David and Goliath is, a, is just a fun story. Um, when it comes to Bible reading, you can make a lot of different ways of selecting, um, you know, maybe you're going to read through a particular book of the Bible. Or, and I've seen this, and, and we've, we did this, I don't know, a, a gazillion years ago with our kids. We just went through and we, we selected out different stories so it's not a story book, but you're selecting stories in the Bible. So you're going you're to read, like tonight, we're going to read about, you know, Noah's going to build the ark. So, you know, you've got that particular chapter, and you're going to read that chapter. And that's what the, that's what the Bible reading is tonight, guys. We're going to read about Noah building the ark. Or we're going to read about the story of David and Goliath. And, you, you know, you're reading the Bible, but you're, you're selecting. So it's, there's nothing wrong with, you know, not going through every single chapter in a particular book of the Bible, uh, as long as you're engaging in the Word of God and focusing on what the Scripture says. And so it's not, it's not a story book, but it is a stories from the Bible. So that is a very, uh, uh, matter of fact, I was, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, I was looking through a list of, uh, and, uh, and I forget which website it was, but it, it had this really good long list of, um, and they identified it as, you know, like 100 of the most important stories in the Bible type of thing because it sell, it's, it's, that's all marketing, but it sells real good. But what they did is they selected out m these multiple, uh, this, this really nice list of very specific stories to focus on if you're working with young people and here's some great things you can read. And, and so there's a lot of great ways to approach that. So, 1 Samuel chapter 17 is a, is a great place. So let's, let's go over there, okay? So you, let's just say you're, uh, you're doing your Bible reading, uh, and, uh, you know, tonight we're going to read about, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to read about um, David and Goliath. And so you get over to that chapter of Scripture, and you begin to do the Bible reading uh, with them. And so, uh, Brother Stephen, why don't you get started with it? And because, you know, it, it's going to start off with the names, okay? So let, let's just, uh, you know, Stephen's going to get started by, by reading um, to, to the kids, all right? First one? Yeah. Now the Philistines <coughs> gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephesdamim. Okay, see, now, now we're having fun. So, you know, you, you, you can either get the name, kids to start uh, pronouncing these names, or you just read it through. We're, we're at, read verse number two. 
Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. All righty. And so now you turn to the kids and say, what does it mean to set the battle in array? So this is where if you're sitting in the bedroom where you grab a bunch of pillows and the blankets and you make, a, you make a mountain over here with pillows and you have the blanket going down, you make another mountain over there with a bunch of other pillows, and that's when you send the young one out to the toy box to get his, his toy soldiers, and then, and then you start putting toy soldiers up on the mountain. And here's, here's the Israelites over here, and here's the Philistines over here. And the kids are sitting there going, all right, and maybe they got Legos, I don't know, and they're making all their little soldier things, and that's when Charlie starts bringing out the tanks, I guess. And so, because if you're going to have a battle, you can't have a battle without tanks. And so now there's tanks and um, you got Jeeps and everything else. And, and so uh, now you got this battle in array. And so now you've set the stage and the kids are sitting there and uh, they're playing with their little Legos and you're, and you're reading the story. And, um, you know, this is, you know, one of those things where um, you're going you're gonna to do whatever you need to do um, to read the Word of God, to engage the kids uh, and to, um, you know, somewhat allow them to enjoy the opportunity. Um, I, let me just make a couple other statements about, uh, you know, Bible reading with kids. Um, and again, a lot of it's personal because we did so many different things. You, you, you do have to be careful with um, too much silliness. And I know that. And kids have a tendency. I, I, I don't know why this is. But kids have a tendency when they start getting silly to, to go overboard with silliness. So you do have to be careful. But um, uh, and I'll, I'll admit this. Um, with, with my dear wife and I, she is, she is much better at handling children's behavior than I am. See, I tend, I tend towards the silliness. I'm the silly side of the family, and she is the more serious side of the family. You need that. It's a good balance, okay? But if, if, I'm, if I'm left uh, unrestrained, I just, it, it all falls into just, just a mess, okay? So maybe your household's like that too. I don't know. But, um, so, uh, but one of the things, especially about a family Bible reading, is you do have to be mindful of, of the, the necessity of not falling into silliness. But, the, of course, the, if the pendulum swings the other direction, then you have such strictness and discipline that the children get very little out of it. You know, sit down and be quiet. We're going to read the Bible. <laughs> oh, there's a great amount of joy right there in a child's heart, you know. And, and so you, you do have to, there is a, there is a balance, okay. And, um, and this is, you know, my mentality is if you make it interesting, if you make it engaging, then the children are going to focus their attention. They are going to listen. They are going to ask questions. They are going to be engaged. And it serves the purpose, and sometimes it may not be, you know, as, as, as flowing as, you know, I want to get through all this X amount of verses here. And if they keep asking questions, we're never going to finish this chapter. Um, I would rather them engaged than, than simply just try to finish something up. So, I mean, that's, that's my thoughts about it. And so now we have the battle in array. And if you've, you know, spread out some sheets on the bed and you got tinker toys or Boy, I just aged myself. You got Lincoln Lot? No. You got Legos, uh, or you got army men there, and you got Jeeps, and you may, maybe there's a, you know, a B-52 flying over. I don't know. But you, you got the battle in array. And now you're reading. The Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. There you go. You got your sheets. You got your army men. There was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. Goliath of Gath. Okay, now you got kids repeating, saying, who is that? Who is it, Charlie? Goliath of Gath. If you please. Whose height was six cubits and a span. Six cubits and a span? What does that mean? What, uh, great, my, my first question I, I would ask, what's a cubit? What is a cubit? And so I, I would ask one of, the, one of the kids, 
what's a cubit? And they'd say, I don't know. And I'd say, well, let's find out. And, of course, now, we have in our, I, I, I had in our library at home, I have it now in my office, and I have, uh, I have Bible dictionary. I love Bible dictionaries. How many of you had a Bible dictionary in your home somewhere? Some shape or form, okay? How many of you know how to get a Bible dictionary on your phone if you need it? Okay, all right, so we're all kind of digital nowadays. This is, this is my, um, this is not the one I use. This is actually a, uh, anytime I see these in a used bookstore, Ungers, I always buy them. It's my favorite Bible dictionary. Mine's in my office. I, I've owned it for th- probably close to 40 years. It's falling apart, but I, it's my favorite. Never going to get rid of it, okay? So anytime I find one in a used books, I usually buy it, and then I give it away. But uh, anyway, this is Unger's Bible Dictionary. I always, I've always had one at the house. And so, you know, if the kids, uh, you know, if we're, let's just sit, we're sitting there doing some Bible reading, okay? Just imagine, imagine Buzz, Eric, and Tom being like, you know, seven, eight, or seven, six, and five, and little Christian Joy, you know, kicking them underneath the table. She's four years old. Just get that picture in your mind, because that's what it was like at our house. And, uh, and I, would, I would ask the kids, so what's a cubit? I don't know. You tell me. You're the preacher. <laughs> you know, that's smart aleck kids. But uh, anyway, I would say, well, go get, go get the dictionary. Go get the Bible dictionary. And so they'd go get the Bible dictionary. So, here you go, Owen. You, oh, you already know it. So look up cubit. I, I have it marked there in yellow. Okay. You get the yellow mark? Yep. Okay, read it. I, I, so I sent him to the, sent him to the, book, uh, to the bookshelf get the, and look up cubit. So he looks up cubit. What's he find? No, it doesn't. What's it say? See mineralogy? Okay, so it's not underneath there. So you have to find you have to find a different section, right? Oh, I marked it in the blue. There you go. So he turns it over to the blue. What's what is meter? Uh, how do you pronounce that? Meteorology. Metro. Yeah, met, met, metology. Meta. Uh, metology. 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 There you go. What is metology? I have the definition right there. Uh, the science of weights and measures for and marvel up to date discussion. Okay, so it's a science of weights and measurements, and so now, now he's learned something, okay? And so there's a whole list of things there, right? Mm-hmm. So you got things like uh, linear measurements, so things like, what, what's the first one listed there? Finger or digit. Oh, a finger or a digit. So did you know that in the book of Jeremiah, it says that the, um, that the pillars out front of the temple tells you how tall they were, how, how round they were, and how thick they were. They were like, I think they were, I think it says they were four, or three, is it three fingers? Three fingers thick. So do you know, do you know what the unit of measure, that's, I mean, it's just going like that, right? So, you know, it's, uh, it's about three quarters of an inch, so um, uh, is a finger. And, and so you can, that's how they used to, used to measure things, like going like that. So, oh, that's four fingers thick, you know? So that's a unit of measure. And th- what's the next one? Hand breath. A hand breath. That's a hand breath. Okay. What's the next one? A span. That's a span. Okay. So from there to there. And what's the next one? Cubit. Oh, a cubit. All right. So now the kids are looking up their Bible dictionary, and uh, there's a lot of other things there, right? I mean, that goes on for like four or five pages, so you can learn all about units of measure and distance and length, and then how, like, units of measure, like, with, with what's a bath, and, and then shekels and all kinds of stuff. And so once you introduce a, a child, well, not even a child. I remember when I first got my first Bible dictionary, I thought it was the greatest tool on earth. I go, this is neat. I never knew this before. And I would be going, through, and plus there's pictures and everything. And, and so once you get a Bible dictionary and you introduce a person to a Bible dictionary, then they realize, boy, I can look everything up. And get, I, I don't have to just sit there and read through it and go, I don't know what that is, and just move on. Um, it's, that, it's that healthy curiosity. Once you introduce the fact that you can get information easily, and I know it's online nowadays, that makes it even easier. But uh, So what's a cubit? Uh, it's right there. It was commonly reckoned as the length of an arm from the 
So I'm, I'm just, I'm going to stop him right here. So this, this would be something like if you're doing your Bible reading with the kids and you get to the something and it tells you about Goliath being nine cubits in a span and you ask them, well, what's a cubit? And then they, I don't know, and then they say, well, let's look it up. And then they get the Bible dictionary out and you're sitting there and you're going, okay, what's it say? And all of a sudden it tells them it is, go ahead. Okay, now the word cubit actually comes from the Latin. From the Latin word cubitum. So now, now, you, now you're teaching them Latin, okay? And it comes from the Latin word cubitum, which cubitum means elbow, by the way. It's, it's Latin for elbow. And it's, so it's the length from the point of the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. Middle finger okay? And it's about how long? 18 inches. About 18 inches, okay? Um, let's see how close I am. A cubit here. Do, 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 do. Well, I'm, I'm at 19. That's not too bad. I'm above average. That's just all I can say. All right. So uh, it's about a, uh, about a cubit. Okay. So now, now you've got a Bible story. Okay. And you're talking about Goliath. And how big's a span? Because he's nine cubits in a span, right? Six cubits in a span. I'm sorry. Six cubits in a span. Thank you. Six cubits in a span. How big's a span? Does it give you an estimate about how, how, how much that is? Uh, about, nine about nine inches. Okay. So let me see. What do I got? Oh, I got eight and a half. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'm not above average on my spans, but I got a good cubit. All right. So, so, so now, okay, this is one of those things where, especially if, you're home, if you homeschool your kids, let's do the math. So, you know, this is, we're, we're just doing Bible reading, but now all of a sudden, what are we doing? We're doing math. So, okay, who wants to do the math? All right. Oh, we got somebody doing math already. Phoebes, what do you got going on? So how did you do that? You did, you did, look at that. She did math. So you, you took 18 inches, right, which is a foot and a half, right? So you take 18 inches and you multiplied it by 6 and then divided by 12. Excellent. Which comes out to be? Nine feet. Nine feet. And then you added a, you add the span, which is? Nine inches. So now Goliath is how tall? Nine feet, nine inches. Nine feet, nine inches. Okay. So that's when you take your kid and you say, how big is that? And so that's when you send them to the toolbox. I got to the church here and I went right downstairs to my toolbox and my tape measure was not in my toolbox. I think Denny took it. I'm not sure. I've been taking his for years. Like I will admit that. And, and so I'm not sure where my, where my tape measure is. But thankfully, we have somebody in the church here that is well prepared for things like this. And so this is where you, this is where you get to kids and say, okay, well, how, how tall is that? Now, okay, granted, you're sitting in a bedroom and your ceiling height is what? About eight foot, right? And so uh, you're going you're gonna to pop the ceiling probably in most houses. But this is when, um, let's see here, um, this young man right there, come on up here. Yeah, you, because we're going to find out how big nine foot nine inches is, okay? You ready? You get taped the end of this. So you go this way, and you tell me when you think you're here. Take the end of that tape measure. You tell me when you think you're at nine foot. Keep going. What, tell, you, tell me when you think you're at nine foot. Keep going. How far do you think that is yet? Think you're at nine foot yet? Yeah. 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 What do you think? We at nine foot yet? You, oh, he's, out, he's a little taller. Keep going. Oh, 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 oh. Ding, 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 ding. We are at nine feet. Nine inches. That is how tall Goliath is. Can, you, can we get that? Hey, stand, stand up on that chair. You're allowed to stand on the chair. It's okay. All right. Can you hold that tape measure up in the air? How high can you hold it up there? So that was, let me see, how high is that? That's only, that's barely even six foot tall right there. So he's higher than that. He is nine foot tall. Keep going. He is nine foot tall. Are we going to hit the ceiling yet? Oh, we hit the ceiling. All right. 
That is, yeah, this is Brother Francis's tape measure, so if it bends, it's his, okay. So keep going. Let me see, are we nine foot yet? So this, this is what you're doing in, your, in the bedroom with the kids here. You're pop, there we are, we're at nine, there he is. That's how tall Goliath is. So now, now your kids, because now you're outside because it won't fit in the bedroom. So now you're outside with your Bible reading, and the kids are going, oh, that is gigantic. And, and thank you very much. Give this young man a big hand. And, and so, so what we've done so far is we've done a little bit of, of carpentry work, okay? Thank you, Brother Francis. I appreciate that so much. Let me return that because I'm not really good at returning tape measures, apparently. All right? And, uh, and so... Um, the, um, we've done a little carpentry work. We use our, we use our tools. Hey, l unless you're getting tools out, you know you haven't accomplished anything. And uh, we've done some math, right? And, and so we've also done some literary work by looking at our Bible dictionary, okay? Um, and so what, what we've accomplished is engage. I mean, this is, this, is very, this is a really simple story from the Bible, isn't it? And, you know, if you're, what you're, what you're doing is you're, you're breeding a healthy curiosity instead of just reading through some, and, and it is possible let me just say it is possible to read through that and just tell the kids well Goliath was nine foot nine inches tall and they go okay and for most children they don't know what that means I mean six foot nine foot two foot three you know to, to them it's all the same until they see it and, and then um, we're, we're just a few, I don't even know what verse we're on. What verse are we on? We just finished four. We, we got four verses in so far, and now we've spent an hour with our Bible reading. The kids are like, you're, and your wife is saying, it's time for the kids to go to bed. Yeah, they got school in the morning. And you're like, oh, we got a couple more verses. And then you go to the next verse, and we're reading about Goliath. And he had a helmet of brass on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. Oh, what? Because, you know, your six-year-old's thinking, you know, would he have, like, letters glued to him? Is that what it was? Is it, like, junk mail? Is that, he's got, like, a junk mail coat? Could you imagine making a junk mail coat? So, so at this point, you're either getting your Bible dictionary out again, or, or you know, kids nowadays are so smart, they've already started Googling it, okay? So how many of you have already Googled coat of mail? What does a coat of mail look like? Okay, who's, Dave, you Googling? No, oh, come on, yes, you. Okay, this morning I made a comment about that song in our hymn book. Uh, you know, the, uh, the old account was settled long ago about the repentance being gone. And before the end of the services, somebody in our congregation Googled it and sent me a, a copy of the song sung by Johnny Cash, and Johnny Cash sings it with repentance in it. So that, that settles it right there. So I'm just saying, even while I'm preaching, folks are Googling, okay? It just happens. So maybe, you, you, maybe you've already Googled coat of mail, and you got a picture. And so there, you know, you're showing your, your kid what a coat of What is a coat of mail? What does that mean? We're not talking about junk mail. What are we talking about? Chain mail. Chain. It's like metal either chains or scales all linked together as armor. And it, and it tells us how much it weighs, right? The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. Okay, now this is where either you're getting your Bible dictionary out again and you're looking up shekels of brass. Now, I've already done this and I've already done the math, okay? So it weighs, it weighs about 78 pounds, so you, at this point, you can either, you know, get the heaviest thing you could possibly think of to put on your child and, and let them walk around it and go on like this. Oh, I can't believe it. Or, or, or you could just kind of pass it on from that point and say, this was really heavy, boys and girls. And he, he wore, and this is, you know, we're, we're introducing um, some information to them where they can say, well, that, well, that is gigantic. And it, it, it gets even better because... And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. Okay, and so we had these he had like brass. And so maybe, maybe one of your kids plays soccer and they have shin guards. So just know he wore brass shin guards 
And they think, well, I got shin guards. And they run to the closet and grab their soccer shin guards and put them in their socks while you're reading, you know, about David and Goliath. And uh, he has a target. That's talking about a kind of a breastplate. So maybe they can stand there. Maybe they got a garbage can lid now, and they got it stuck to the front of them. And he's got a helmet on his head. I've, uh, Dave, you built me a helmet a while back. I still have it in my office, and so uh, out of cardboard. So uh, maybe at that point, you know, your, one of your kids has got all this stuff on, and it even gets better after this. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Okay, what's a weaver's beam? What's that? A loom. And you know what a loom is, okay? So, uh, so it's, it's the, the, the top beam of a loom where they would make fabric, like a rug or something like that. It's a very heavy piece of wood. And, and you know, in my office, I think there's a couple pieces of wood in there. Maybe you go out to the garage, you bring in a two by four or something, and you know, two by four by eight. And uh, unless you're at Tom's house, you got two by four by 10. I'm sure you got a 10 foot one laying around somewhere. And, and so you come, you know, you could. You come in from the garage to, into their bedroom with this big two by four and go, boom! Here it is, and uh, and it had a it had a spearhead on it. The spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron. Okay, and so now you're doing the math again. If you want to do that, I already done the math, and it weighs uh, about seventeen pounds. So just just the spearhead itself weighed almost twenty pounds. Okay. So just imagine this 20-pound piece of, of, of brass on top of this, of this 10-foot pole. Goliath, he, you know, he is 9 foot, 9 foot 9 inches tall, and he's got this, and, and you're standing there, you know, with this 2 by 4 um, and, and your kids are going, wow. And we're only on verse what? Seven. Yeah, okay. So, and I'm not saying that every time you sit down and do Bible reading with kids, that you're doing this. Um, just, this, I chose this particular story because it has so much really cool stuff in it. Um, and not all of them are like that. There are, uh, and let me just say, I'm talking about kids doing Bible reading with kids. Um, I'm the kind of person that if I'm reading things like that, I'm, I, I'm not getting two by fours out of the garage, but I'm pulling out my Bible dictionary. I, I have a Bible dictionary sitting by my desk all the time um, because that's, I do that a lot. Um, I, ha, I, have, I have notebooks that I keep when I'm doing my Bible reading. It's not uncommon where I'll just stop uh, and just say, okay, what does that mean? And I'll take a few minutes for myself personally and look things up. I look up definitions of words. I look up uh, things like, you know, weights and measurements. Um, there have been times that, like you're, you're reading about maybe the temple or maybe, maybe you're reading about Noah's ark. Noah, build an ark. And God's telling them how many, how many cubits the ark's going to be. So you've got your Bible dictionary out. You've looked up your cubits. You've done the math. And I, I've got notebooks from my Bible reading where I'll sit down and I'll just actually write out... Um, make a little drawing of how big the ark is, or how big the, uh, the ark, um, Noah's ark is, um, or the layout of the temple, and I'll have all the dimensions. And I just, I, I, it's, it's one of those things where I, there, there's sometimes I just, I'm not going to go through a particular pa- portion of scripture without defining everything that's in there. And what... And I'm not saying every time you sit down and do Bible reading with your children, you're going to be doing any kind of theatrics or anything like that. But I will say this. It is good to engage children in Bible reading with things like that in order to develop within them a hungry and and purposeful sense of curiosity so that when they are approaching the Word of God, um, they are asking the questions too. And, and not just simply reading the Bible for the sake of reading the Bible, but reading the Bible with purpose and with desire to learn. What does this mean? And, and so, you know, when, when, you know, we're there in Nehemiah chapter 8 a little bit ago, and it's talking about, um, talking about reading the Word of God and, and um, 
uh, talking about, um, you know, making the sense of it. We, we just read a couple of verses here in, in the book of, uh, a book of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We didn't even get to the good stuff. I mean, the good stuff of the story and that conflict that goes on. It goes on and talks about David. It talks about his relationship to his brothers. Um, it, it talks about the fact that he's a shepherd. And, and there's a lot of things that you can talk about with kids about David's engagement as a shepherd. He talks about protecting sheep and from lions and from bears. He, he talks about, you know, you got the, the slings going on there. We have, we have Saul putting his, his armor on David that doesn't fit. Could you imagine doing that with kids? Go get my coat. Try it on. You got this little, you know, six-year-old with, you know, with, you know, your clothes on walking around going, uh, uh, uh. And they go, well, I can't wear this. Well, no kidding. And David couldn't wear Saul's uh, armor either. And, and you can talk about those things. And, and, and that, oh, is there not a cause? That's that great phrase that David uses. You can ask your kids, what does he mean by that? And, of course, the little ones really aren't going to understand that. But as they get older, they're going to start thinking, what does that mean? What did he mean when he said that? What's the cause, that defense of, of, of who God is and, and standing up for what you know is right and, and, and taking, taking the risk in, in order to stand up for what you know is the truth? And uh, there's a great lesson there, and it's, and it's all wrapped up in a little phrase, and, and you, you, you begin to ask the hard questions to kids sometimes. And, uh, I mean, what a great story that is. And, of course, you know, he has, I mean, what's he deliver? He delivers, um, was it bread? And uh, I know some of it's cheese. He delivers cheese. You can, I mean, you can talk to the kids about where they get cheese at. I mean, they don't have a, they don't shop right. I mean, that, did they, how, how'd they get cheese, Owen? Uh, they would have to go to the market. You think he went to the market? He went to Wawa to get cheese? Uh, not Wawa, the market. Now, Dave, what did David do for a living? He wants sheep. What, did, what can you get from sheep? Uh, wool. Yeah. Um. Mrs. Francis, what else can you get from them? You can get milk. You can get milk. You can drink milk. What else can you do with milk? You can make cheese. You can make cheese. Do you, you think David's family were cheese makers? Do you think so? Have you ever had goat's cheese? Hmm. It sounds like we're going to have, next time you guys go to the grocery store. No. This, this, I mean, this is, this is fun stuff. I know. And here's David, and he's delivering. His dad says, here, take this cheese to the, uh, to the, uh, you know, the, the, the guys that run the army there. Hand him his cheese. And, of course, he, they're shepherds. And, of course, they're making cheese. And, and maybe the next time you're in your store there and you have the opportunity, you're going down the cheese aisle, you'll say, hey, come on over here. Look, there's goat cheese. Goat cheese, that's the kind of stuff that David made. Yeah, exactly. You want to try some? And you buy some goat cheese, you take it home. Not only do you get to it, and they, they may have never tried that before in their life and have, have, may have turned their nose up to it a thousand times before, but because they know David's family made goat cheese, they might give it a shot. And now you've conquered another great hurdle of getting a child to eat something they would never eat before because David ate goat cheese, okay? And, and so now, 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 you're, now you've taken a Bible lesson and you've taken it into the grocery store and you have your children thinking about the Word of God while they're sitting there shopping at the shop right and making lunch the next day with goat cheese. And all from, a, all from a Bible lesson, because you just took a pause as, as you know, David's uh, dad um, said, hey, take this cheese, and now you've learned a lesson. And so these are the kind of things that engage young people, um, and, I, and I will say, um, that's the kind of stuff that goes through my head when I'm reading my Bible, I'm thinking about things like, oh, goat, they had cheese. They, they, made, they would have made cheese. And, and I, I think about things like weights and measurements. And I think about locations, places. I think about names. 
uh, as I'm reading my Bible, and I'm thinking about who are these people? Do, do I know them from somewhere else? And I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking up names, and I'm doing cross-references. And, and sure, you, you're not going to read, a, um, you know, we've only made it through seven verses, right? And uh, you're, you're not going to read maybe as much as, as you thought you were going to, uh, but you've engaged um, your kids, your family uh, in something that is a lot more than just simply reading some Bible tonight. So, um, you know, the, uh, the goal, of course, as, you know, we, we, we were talking about Timothy a little bit ago, First, Second Timothy chapter 3, and, and, you know, before it talks about inspiration, it says, and that from a child, talking about Timothy, and that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. The intent, of course, with introducing children to the Holy Scriptures when they're young is that it will make them wise. There is a, there's an intention. There's, there is, there is a, um, a desire to introduce the Scriptures and, a, and, a, and, a, and not just say, well, they, you know, they got a Bible, but that they, they, they have a hunger for the Bible. They have a, a desire to look into it. They have a curiosity about what's, what the truth is in there. And, and you've introduced that. You know, the, the, there's a great verse of Scripture, and you're familiar with it. You know it. Um, and it's um, um, uh, in, in, the book of, in the book of Proverbs where it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Uh, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And that, that is a great verse of Scripture. And, and of course, you know, a, a proverb is an observation of what is, what is likely to happen. And, and so it, it certainly is true that not every child that is raised up in church ends up staying in church all their life. And I know that. And it's not because the proverb is incorrect. The proverb is an observation of something that is likely to happen. And so the, the training of a child is our responsibility because we want our children to go in a particular direction. And part of that training is, of course, is to introduce them to the Word of God and, and, and introduce a love for the Scriptures. It, it's not just, you know, one of those things that, you know, well, we always had a Bible around the house. You know, it, it's, it's as if it's, you know, just like a piece of the furniture like everything else that we have at home. Um, no, but it, there is a, there, we have a love for it, and we're instilling a love in our children's lives for the Word of God, a curiosity, a desire to read more. And, and so these are the type of things that we want to put uh, and, and introduce our kids to. Let me, let me just say, when it comes to Bible reading, um, we, especially with young people, um, you know, make it fun. Um, it's not drudgery. You're not over disciplining them just to, you know, sit down and get your Bible reading done. You're making it. You're, it's um, you're, you're making it an enjoyable part of the day. Uh, we always, uh, with our kids, we always took turns with the reading. Sometimes, you know, the, sometimes the kids use silly voices when they were reading. Um, sometimes I would use silly voices. Often we would sit on the floor and do it. It, it wasn't always in a, you know, in a in a stoic kind of you know, um, orderly type of fashion. Um, uh, may, always make it engaging. Ask questions. Let them ask questions. Uh, you know, looking up words, things like that. Drawing pictures, however you do it, especially if they're really young and you're going through a Bible story. And they give them an opportunity. You know, you draw a picture of the ark. Let me see what you think the ark looks like. And, and, and you know, they get their crayons out and off they go. And, and they're just having a great time with it. And the ark's purple and that's all right. Because, you know, what color shit them would anyway? You know, it's got to be purple, I guess. But, you know, uh, let them write stuff down. Let them take notes if they want to take notes. Treat it uh, with, you know, with some type of enjoyment or engagement. Certainly it's okay to reward kids. Um, you know, if they're going to sit through a you know, Bible lesson and a story and things like that. If, you know, when we get done, we're going to have ice cream or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, some, um, um, sometimes uh, some parents, they put together, you know, like a, um, especially as the kids get older and they have their own personal Bible time, you know, have a little chart. Every time you do your Bible reading that, you know, that day, you put a little star up there when you finish your Bible reading. If you, you do the whole week, there's, you know, some kind, of, some kind of thing that you get at the end. There's nothing wrong with doing that, um, you know, rewarding kids for, for being consistent and for being disciplined. It builds 
discipline, by uh, allowing them to see progress in that way. There's a lot of different ways and creative ways you can do that. And you know, but one of the, I guess one of the best things that you can do um, in, in, as far as encouraging others is to be consistent yourself with it. And uh, when, when your children um, or other people that are in your household or that you know um, understand that you have a love and a hunger for the things of God and for the Word of God, um, and it, it, would help, it helps instill that in them. Because if they don't think you care, then, then why do you think they're ever going to care? And, and so these are the type of things. And, and they're small. Some of them are kind of silly. And, um, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit of, uh, of uh, extra time and effort. And, but it's worth it. it. It's worth it when years down the road you see your kids with a Bible. And when your kids are teenagers and they're, and they're reading the Word of God on their own. And when your children come to you and ask you Bible questions. Or maybe they don't come to you, maybe they text you. That's what kids now do nowadays, right? They, uh, they IM you a Bible question. And, and then you, you sit back and go, wow, that is just amazing. So, you know, our desire, of course, is... Um, as, as Paul makes the observation with Timothy, that when, when they're children, to get the word of God in it, because the idea is to make them wise. First of all, make them wise unto salvation. But we see with Timothy, it went f- so much further than that. And, and that, that's, isn't that our goal anyway? To make sure that the word of God is, as it's been brought into our household, that it filters through everybody. And that everybody has an opportunity of allowing the Word of God to accomplish God's will in their lives. And so I just present that before you tonight and ask you to consider how the Word of God um, is impacting your household. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your wonderful grace. It was extended to us in our salvation. And we're so thankful for what you've accomplished in our lives as you brought Christ to us. But Lord, for many of us, we have children, there are grandchildren, there are people that we have the opportunity of ministering to, young people. And and yet, Father, um, that grace that you've extended to us, we, we want to make sure that we extend it to others. So, so, Lord, we ask you, please, to help us to be wise. Help us to be purposeful. Help us to be very mindful of those around us that need to hear the truth. And, Lord, that we would take the opportunity of doing everything that we possibly can to read the Word of God distinctly, to make the sense of it, and to cause them to understand. And Lord, we'll give you the glory for what transpires, the results of it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.